Please come in. You'll catch your death in this weather. Thank you very much. Yes, quite. We've come a long way to see the doctor. Ah, the doctor. Right this way. Igor, you know I don't like to be interrupted during my work. Yes, master. But this man has come a long way to speak with you. Very well, then. Doctor, I received a correspondence from you some time ago. You seem terrified. I need to know what happened. Ah, Dr. Sinclair. You should not have come here. Now I've come all this way. If you aren't going to answer my question, the least you could do is face me. Very well, then. God! His... his face! <laughs> it's time, friends, for the weekly spooky Halloween episode! Well, I was working in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight for my monster from the slab began to rise and suddenly, to my surprise, he did the mash! He did the monster mash! The monster mash. It was a graveyard smash! He did the mash! It caught on in a flash! He did the mash! He did the monster mash! From my laboratory in the castle east to the master bedroom where the vampires feast, the ghouls all came from their humble abodes to get a jolt from my own into the mash! He did the mash! Before we go any deeper into this Halloween episode, first, a word from our very special sponsor. Hey, kids! Hey! We know this Halloween season is very important to you, so we're here to help you have more fun. The only thing better than running amok across the neighborhood in a flurry of free sugar and vandalism is having your very own best friend you can take with you anywhere. That's why we'd like to introduce you to the Shovel Buddy. With our patent-pending oak-handled spade after just a few hours of fun labor at the local graveyard, you can have a friend that lasts a lifetime. Take them to school. Take them to the playground. Even take them to your mom or dad's office. With Shovel Buddy, you never know what fun you'll dig up. Shovel Buddy by Diablo. Available wherever toys are sold. I love you, Shovel Buddy. I don't even care if you do smell. I mean, Daddy smells, and I love him. Or do I? Hey, Daddy! 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 <laughs> and a friend that can't possibly uh, get sick. <laughs> I'm so- <laughs> I'm cracking myself up because uh, I wanted to do something really wild. My name's I'm Henrik Kuto, by the way, your host and narrator. In case you 
didn't know. Um, I, I wanted to do something uh, different for this episode. I wanted to have a little bit of fun and, and break it up a little, make it kind of stand out, because this is not only our Halloween episode, but this is also the one-year anniversary of the program launching. And it has been an incredible ride. And just in the last few months, the show has really picked up a lot of steam. And I, I'm so thankful, and hopefully most of you are still uh, tuned in after the uh, bizarre format change that is uh, you know, going to be very special to this episode, because I want to have a little bit of fun, give you a little something to chuckle at, a little something to, uh, to uh, get you in that, that Halloween spirit, because you know... We want to be scared, but we also like to laugh. That's like the best part about Halloween. That's why I always love the Monster Mash, uh, which, uh, by the way, that opening uh, song, the Monster Mash, was recorded by myself and uh, a bunch of musician friends. And uh, I think it turned out pretty well. So I hope that helps get you kind of churning along. But that being said, we are going to get to the spooky. In fact, I have a warm up for you right now before we get to our main course. Do you feel it? A little chill in the air? Some leaves rustling. I felt a funeral in my brain, and mourners to and fro kept treading, treading, till it seemed that sense was breaking through. And when they all were seated, a service like a drum kept beating, beating, till I thought my mind was going numb. And then I heard them lift a box and creak across my soul, and with those same boots of lead again, then space began to toll, as all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear, and I in silence, some strange race, wrecked, solitary, here. And then a plank in reason broke, and I dropped down and down, and hit a world at every plunge, and finished knowing, then... I Felt a Funeral in My Brain by Emily Dickinson. That one, my friends, terrified an elementary school Henrik very, very much. So I felt like it was a good idea to give it a read. Thank you all so much. This is the 54th episode of Weekly Spooky. We've been coming to you every single Wednesday since Halloween 2019. It's a dream. It's a dream to get to read scary stuff in a dark room and give myself goosebumps and then share it with you guys and hear how much you've been enjoying it. But it's also been a dream working with all of these authors. I've met so many great authors and realized I knew many incredible authors along the way. People who submit stories so often, we've basically used original stories every single week, with one exception when I read an Edgar Allan Poe story. That's incredible to me, and I want to say thank you so much to the authors for contributing so much. I am so pleased when you guys send me emails and text messages and tell me how much it means to you to have a outlet to write some short stories and get them heard by people. It's my pleasure, my friends. It is my pleasure. And of course, you listening right now, uh, if you're listening for the first time or if you've just joined us this month, this spooky month of October, subscribe, please, on whatever podcast app you like and join us every Wednesday That's the whole point of the show, is to keep that Halloween spirit, that feeling of being a kid and being scared shitless as a kid, alive all year long. That is the goal. So hit subscribe and listen every week. I promise you, I will do my best to deliver. And for those of you who have gotten on board on our Patreon, thank you so much. You've really allowed us to put a year in and now a second year. So uh, if you want to support the show in any way, and I'm not here to tell you you have to, Go to weeklyspooky.com. You can join the Patreon. You could buy a t-shirt, a hooded sweatshirt. You could just send us an email at weeklyspooky at gmail.com and tell us you're enjoying what we're doing. Any of that is highly appreciated. Ooh. All of a sudden, I just got a... I got a chill. The cold air is definitely coming in this season, and on top of that, we're entering... All Hallows Eve. It's a night when the layer between the living world and the spirit world becomes permeable. It's a time when you can cross over. Now, you can cross over to the spirit side 
any time. It's really not that difficult. People do it all the time. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but you can. But uh, coming through the other way, that's a whole other game. So before we start tonight's feature story, just uh, remember why you wear those Halloween costumes and why you put those fun jack-o'-lanterns on your porch because it's a night to respect and if you forget that well it's going to be all tricks and very few treats if you know what I mean anyway I'm getting off topic tonight's story is very special it's written by Shane Migliavaca Shane wrote the first story we ever read on Weekly Spooky called Mischief Night well this story is a sequel You don't have to listen to the first episode to understand it, but if you listen to the first episode after this, it'll give you a little clearer glimpse into the evils that could be lurking on Halloween night, and why it is exactly they call it Mischief Night. So enjoy the story, my friends. It's a real scary one. It's real fun, and I'll be here afterward to uh, make sure you're all right. Another Mischief Night by Shane Migliavaca. Fresh from nursing school, Kay Ferris had only been at Forbes Sanitarium for three months. Yet, she was already sure she'd never get used to that building or the psychotics that dwelled within. Lightning flashed outside, its crooked fingers searching for the ground. Halloween was a few days away, but for Kay... It may as well be tonight. The dark hallways and stillness of level five were creeping her out, and the damn storm wasn't helping matters. Dr. Chandler had all the patients on level five sedated early, something to be thankful for, she thought, as she made her rounds. But with the storm, it really was the only course of action as bad weather tended to knock out the sanitarium's power. And since the doors were locked electronically, if the power went out, All the doors would unlock. The cheapskates in charge refused to pay for a backup generator. She stopped. Ahead was the end of the hall, and the last door on the left behind which sat Patient 15. Patient 15, that girl in the mask, Amanda Williams, she was worse than all the others. The girl just sat there, day and night, in her white mask never making a sound. Chandler, who had treated the girl since she'd first arrived, said she wore the mask out of shame. Shame that her brother was murdered in a botched robbery while she stood by, paralyzed with fear. Kay heard noises coming from the room late at night, not surprising since Amanda was the only patient that was never sedated, as Chandler felt it unnecessary. Kay suspected the old man thought of the girl as a daughter. She chuckled, picturing them sitting down for a Sunday dinner. She started down the hall again when there was a bright flash of lightning, followed by a loud crash of thunder. The lights dimmed before finally flickering back on. Spooky shit, huh? Kay jumped. She spun around to see Johnny Earl behind her. The husky orderly smirked, and she felt her face turning red. What? Down there. The last cell. His loud, booming voice trailed off into a whisper. Patient 15. I guess, Kay shrugged, not wanting to let on how freaked the girl made her feel. All the ghosts and goblins will be coming out soon, he made eerie sounds. I can protect you. Save the trick-or-treat shit for Halloween night, Johnny Earl. Thank God Halloween was on a Saturday this year, Kay thought, safe in the knowledge that she had the day off. Hey, I'm sorry. How about I make it up to you? He touched her arm, making Kay flinch. There's some empty rooms downstairs. We could, uh, take a little break. She pulled away from the big orderly. Not a chance. Stuck-up bitch. Kay heard him mumble as she walked away. Smiling at his disappointment, she walked back to the nurse's station. An older nurse sat watching a small TV which sat next to a large jack-o'-lantern. 
Lightning flashed, causing the lights to dim again. The woman looked up as Kay approached. Don't worry, the older woman took out a cigarette, lighting it up. Happens every time there's a big storm. A sinister laugh erupted from the TV. 31 days of Halloween will return with Jesse James meets Frankenstein's daughter after these horrendous arcane adverts. Mrs. Bradley was the senior nurse on the fifth floor, which meant she could do whatever the hell she wanted, so the old nurse spent her shift watching old horror movies and smoking. How are all our little chickadees? Sleeping. Good, (coughs) Mrs. Bradley coughed. Sit down for a bit. They ain't going anywhere. Kay sat, stifling a cough. She hadn't talked to the older nurse much since starting at Forbes. Bradley intimidated her, and Kay had heard stories from the other nurses that the old woman could be quite the tyrant if you crossed her. So Kay did as she was told and kept her head down. You like it here? She felt her throat tighten as Kay strained to think of the appropriate words. Um, it's a shithole, Mrs. Bradley laughed. Don't worry about trying to kiss my ass and say this is a great place. Do your job, put in your time, and if you're smart, you'll use this as a stepping stone. After a few moments of silence, Kay worked up the courage to ask a question. How come you stayed? Before answering, the old nurse tapped some ash into a coffee cup. Big fish, small pond. If I'd gone somewhere else, I'd have to start over again. Johnny Earl sauntered towards them. Well, well, well. Nobody told me it was break time. He made a hurt face. Standing, Kay adjusted her uniform. Well, back to it. She walked by Johnny Earl, giving him the cold shoulder. Kay could feel them both watching her as she walked away. She listened to the squeak of her sneakers on the cold linoleum floor. Outside, lightning flashed, the brightest one yet. On its heels was a building shaking rumble as the thunder rolled above the earth. The lights flickered and hummed again before going out. This time, they remained dark. Oh fuck, Kay muttered to herself. She stood alone in the hallway, darkness surrounding her. Kay used the faint light from outside to find the wall. Slowly, feeling along the wall, her hand glided over the concrete of the wall and the metal of the doors. She continued on this way until she bumped face-first into the wall at the hall's end. Embarrassed, Kay headed back. She could see the pumpkin grinning there by the now-dark TV, a fiery face grinning at her, a beacon in the dark. Another sharp blast of lightning revealed the older nurse sitting there in her chair. Kay's eyes strained to adjust after the bright flash of light. This is really something... Kay said, feeling a little better in the veteran's presence. I'm sure the power will be back on soon, right? Unable to see but the faintest outline of the older nurse, Kay turned the face of the jack-o'-lantern towards the woman. Mrs. Bradley? The woman's head slumped to the side, her eyes open and wide, her swollen tongue hung limp from her mouth, which was frozen in a silent scream. Nearly tipping over her own feet, Kay backed away. What should she do? Find Johnny Earl? Call the cops? Slowly turning, Kay came face to face with a blank white face mask. Narrowed eyes sized her up from behind it. Amanda was all Kay could spit out before the strong, muscular hands gripped her by her throat, lifting her off the ground. Amanda's eyes met Kay's. Cold. Deep and somehow innocent. Suddenly, there was a deafening crack, and it was over. Kay's body hit the linoleum floor with a dull thud. Amanda stepped over the body without a second glance. She had much to do. Kyle Williams felt guilty as he put on his Halloween costume. Amanda would want him to go out, have a good time, The thought of her made him touch the side of his face as he ran his hand over the scar on his cheek. If only he'd done something to help her that night. Come on, lead ass! Trevor, his impatient roommate, stood in the door, dressed as Dracula. Them wild women ain't waiting forever! Sure, almost done. 
Truthfully, he was glad to be going. It was a chance to get out of the dorm instead of sitting around by himself while everybody had fun. I can't believe you're going as a hobo. I'm not a hobo, Kyle groaned. I'm Doctor Who. I've seen Doctor Who. He doesn't dress like a hobo. The second one did. Trevor shook his head. Whatever, man. I'll take your word for it. Let's go. As they pulled up the driveway, Kyle was amazed by just how many people were there. Holy shit. Got that right, Trevor said, looking for an open spot on the lawn to park. I think the whole college is here, and then some. Finding a spot on the outer edge of the lawn, Trevor parked. They got out, both marveling at the lit-up three-story house, Halloween lights crisscrossing its front. A pretty Latino woman in a revealing red dress and shoddy black wig, a close enough approximation of Sigourney Weaver from Ghostbusters, brushed past Kyle as he and Trevor made their way towards the house. Sorry, she said, turning to look at Kyle, before disappearing behind a van. No prob, Kyle replied, watching her go. Dude, she was checking you out. Yeah, right. Fuck, she was, trust me. Really? Trevor nods. Go on. I'll be inside. Kyle hesitated for a moment before going to look for the girl in the red dress. Poking his head around the other side of the van, Kyle scanned the rows of parked cars. A guy, his hair pulled back into a ponytail, dressed in a karate gi and a blonde girl in a cheerleader uniform, stared at him as he prowled around looking for the girl. He headed back towards where they'd parked. It was like the girl had vanished into thin air. Hey, over here! Kyle turned to see the girl in the red dress leaning against a tree. Hi, he stammered. She beckoned him over. Kyle Williams? Yeah. Come with me if you want to live. What? I always wanted to say that. A man cleared his throat, stepping from behind a tree. Officer Mortez, we don't have time for shenanigans. The man rubbed his hands together. His thinning white hair was combed back. Kyle was very familiar with the little man. Dr. Chandler? Kyle said, perplexed. What are you doing here? Did something happen? The doctor stroked his chin. Your sister escaped after killing two nurses and an orderly. And later she stole a car after killing a motorist, Mortez added. Kyle looked at the pair dumbfounded. Why? Mortez scanned the area. Let's get to the car. We can talk about it there. I don't like being out in the open. She hustled them to an unmarked car. Kyle stopped. What about Trevor? I don't want to just ditch him. Mortez pushed Kyle into the back seat in response. Chandler slid into the passenger seat just in time as Mortez peeled out. How is this possible, Doc? Kyle asked. I thought she was harmless. It's complicated. Something must have been triggered within her. As the doctor tried to explain his theory, Kyle became aware of the headlights bearing down on them. Are we? Mortez cut him off. Being followed? Yes, since we left the party. So you're a cop? Sure am, she said, their eyes meeting in the rearview mirror. Great legs for a cop, Kyle said under his breath as he looked over his shoulder. Mortez took the radio from the dashboard. Got the kid and the doc heading in. Over. Kid? Kyle mumbled. I'm in college. Kyle could hear the other car gunning its engine as it accelerated before pulling up alongside them. Kyle made out an all-too-familiar face in the driver's seat. His sister's blank white face mask stared back at him. Amanda swerved the car into them. Mortez fought to keep the car on the road as they were struck again. Why the hell is she doing this? Kyle screamed over the scraping of metal. Mortez managed to shake off the other car for a moment, but Amanda hit the gas and rammed their car again. Your sister is getting on my nerves, Mortez snapped. As Amanda continued her assault, Kyle leaned over the front seat. He looked at Chandler, who was sweating profusely. Why is she doing this, Doc? Chandler looked ready to faint. She wants... to kill you. Before Kyle had a chance to process this, Amanda sent their car flying off the road and into a ditch. Kyle wasn't sure which one of them was screaming at the top of their lungs before he realized it was himself as darkness descended upon him. Hey, Great Gatsby, wake the fuck up. He looked up to see Mortez hovering over him. As she pulled him up, he saw Chandler nursing a nasty gash on his forehead. Where is she? Kyle asked, feeling a sting of pain in his back. Don't know. We gotta get out of here. 
Mortez pulled a pistol from her thigh holster, flashing a bit of leg. I radioed in our situation. There's nobody close and I'm not hanging around here waiting for your crazy sister to show up. She popped the trunk open, rummaging around. She pulled out a tire iron and offered it to Kyle. Merry Christmas, don't say I never gave you anything. He took it, turning the dingy-looking metal bar over in his hands. If I can get close enough, Chandler spoke up. You don't need violence. He pulls a syringe from his jacket. I can sedate her. Mortez frowned. We'll see, Doc. Can you walk okay? I I think so, officer. Kyle helped him forward as they headed into the tree line beyond the ditch. Mortez took point. Kyle leaned in close as he helped Chandler step over a tree root. Why is she doing this? As you know, your sister believes you died in that home invasion. He wheezed between words. Think of that time you visited her in the hospital, when she became agitated. Agitated was one way to say it, Kyle thought. He could still remember that day, not that long after that Halloween invasion. The doctor had ushered him into her room. Upon seeing him, Amanda had started screaming at the top of her lungs, a wild, terrified look in her eyes. Since then, his visits consisted of seeing her through two-way glass. The doctor cleared his throat before finishing. What I learned is, your sister feels you're an imposter, a phony duplicate of her brother, a doppelganger. Kyle let the words sink in as they made slow progress through the heavily wooded area. His sister, the one he loved more than anything else in life, truly wanted to destroy him. Mortez motioned for them to stop. There's a field up ahead. Sit tight. I'll take a look. Not a good idea, Kyle replied. Chill, kid. I'm just going five feet. She slipped through the trees as Kyle shook his head. I'm not a kid. After a few minutes, Mortez came back. Looks like a farm in the distance. Can't tell if there's anybody there. I think it's our best bet. There might be a phone or a car. Beyond the trees was a large field overgrown with tall grass. As they started across, Kyle felt his heart beat faster. Amanda could be anywhere out there, lying in wait. The grass was over waist high, tall enough to conceal one very pissed off sister. A cool autumn breeze rolled over the field. The grass swayed back and forth. Kyle's eyes darted back and forth as he gripped the tire iron tightly. Suddenly, he caught a black shape off to their left in the field, just sitting. Moonlight gave it a vague, ominous shape. What the hell is that? What is what? Mortez asked. There, Kyle pointed with the tire iron. A tractor, maybe, Chandler offered. They kept going. Like some great beast opening its eyes after a long slumber, headlights flooded the field as the dark shape roared to life, the car's tires peeling out as it shot forward towards the trio. Shit, Mortez spat as she took aim. She fired off around as the car screamed towards her. Mortez dove to the side as the car barreled by, heading straight towards Chandler and Kyle. Kyle grabbed Chandler and pushed the startled doctor to the ground and out of the car's path. The vehicle spun around for another attempt. Kyle was running and screaming before he even realized what he was doing. All that he knew was he had to draw the car away from them. Amanda! Kyle screamed as he ran full tilt towards the farmhouse. Maybe there was something there he could stop his sister with. Adrenaline was the only thing fueling his fight. He ran, huffing and puffing until the world slipped out from beneath his feet and he fell face first on the grass. Regaining his wits, Kyle rolled at the last possible minute out of the way of the oncoming car. Screeching to a stop, the car now blocked his path to the farmhouse. Amanda met his gaze behind the wheel of the car. Getting to his feet, Kyle felt the sting of a skinned knee and a twisted ankle acquired from his tumble. Hobbling towards the barn, he heard the car slowly turn around. No rush. She had plenty of time to kill him. The brake lights bathed the landscape in a bloody red hue. The place looked deserted. A good thing no one else could get in his sister's path. Kyle pushed open the large barn doors. The headlights of the slowly approaching car at his back illuminated the dusty interior. Kyle entered the barn as the car crept further towards him. He could feel Amanda's eyes fixed on him as well as the weight of the tire iron in his hand. He turned as the car lurched forward and stopped. Then moved forward again. It was halfway in the barn now. She was taunting him. Playing with him. The high beam stung his eyes as the car drew closer. God damn it! Mortez pushed tall stalks of grass out of her way. When she'd gone down after the car had nearly clipped her, she'd lost her gun. A fucking rookie mistake. It had to be here somewhere. 
She glanced up across the field. The light from the car was still visible. Stay here, Doc, she ordered. I gotta help the kid. Chandler tried to say something, and she cut him off. You'll be a bigger help finding my gun. Take this, then, he handed her the syringe. It'll put her out quick. She took off running. If the kid was dead when she got there, Mortez would make sure his sister was, too. Fucking knock her out. No going back to a nice cell for that bitch, she thought. If Chandler didn't like that, he could take it up with her captain. The car stopped a couple of feet from where Kyle stood. The roar of the great beast died as Amanda turned the engine off. The bright, blinding headlights faded, leaving spots in Kyle's eyes. Spots or not, he could see the pale white mask watching him from behind the wheel. Come on, he taunted. You want me? I'm right here. The car door swung open as Amanda exited the vehicle. Her eyes blazed behind the mask, studying him. It's me, Kyle said. Don't you recognize me, sis? As Amanda moved away from the car, Kyle could see she was holding a large knife in her blood-stained hands. He held out the tire iron at the end of his trembling arm. I I don't want to hurt you, okay? She moved forward, her gaze never left him. I'm not some copy, you know. It's it's me, Kyle. Raising the blade, she advanced. R- remember when Bobby Ivor stole my book bag? You you threatened to kick his ass after school if he didn't give it back. Amanda stopped. Her eyes locked on him. Come on, th- there has to be something there, Kyle pleaded. Remember when you were hung up on by Stevie Lee? You were crying in your room, and I sat with you. You have to remember. She raised the knife over her head, ready to strike. Kyle touched the scar on his cheek. See this? That man did this. He lied about killing me to his buddy. He lied to save me. I didn't die that night. Amanda's hand shook. She started to lower the knife. Don't you fucking move, you crazy bitch. Mortez stood behind the car holding a broken board. Stay away, Kyle warned. Amanda turned towards the young cop and let out an inhuman howl. She leapt onto the car's roof in two swift movements. She crouched there, scraping the car's roof with her knife. Kyle rushed forward, trying to put himself between the two. He was too late as Amanda jumped off the car toward Mortez. Kyle caught a glimpse of the blade as the two women collided. The two struggled as Kyle tried in vain to separate them. Kyle was pushed away from the skirmish but managed to see Amanda stand, holding Mortez by the throat. His sister's fingers tightened like a constrictor on the cop's neck. For her part, the struggling Mortez managed to land a solid punch to Amanda's face, stunning the woman and cracking her mask in the process. But her grip remained firm. Let her go, Kyle pleaded. We can go home. I'll take you. Amanda let go of Mortez and turned to her brother. Half of her mask gave way, revealing the pale, beautiful face of a young woman. Still gasping for air, Mortez jammed the syringe into Amanda's shoulder. Amanda responded with a backhand that sent Mortez violently to the ground. She started to walk away from them, staggering as she went, until finally collapsing against the side of the car. Kyle took her in his arms, sliding her into the back seat of the car. What are you doing? Mortez asked, barely able to speak. I'm taking her home, he said, getting into the car. She'll kill you. We're family, he said, starting the car. Mortez could only lean weakly against the barn door and watch them drive off into the black October night. I'm not going to lie. That story, especially that first half, was some serious goosebump fodder for myself as I was reading it out loud. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a whole lot. If you haven't heard Mischief Night, the first part of this story, it is episode numero uno. That's number one uh, on the podcast feed. So please check it out. And while you're there, make sure you're subscribed because every Wednesday we're going to be back. I hope no matter what you're doing this Halloween, whether you're staying completely and utterly socially distanced or going to a very small gap, gathering, just renting some movies, going to the theater, going to the drive-in, handing out candy, or anything in between. I hope you're having fun, I hope you're being safe, and I hope you, uh, I hope you just, uh, find that childlike wonderment and happiness that Halloween is meant to bring, because we can definitely all use it. 2020 has been challenging, my friends, but... I have been right here with you the entire time, ready to spin some yarns, and I will be for a whole other year. 
Um, did you hear that? Maybe it's just in my headphones. I'm, I'm sure it's nothing. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I got myself a little creeped out there. I guess I better go outside and make sure the jack-o'-lantern's still lit. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's what I'm going to do. So, um, yeah, big thank you to the listeners and the Patreon backers. Again, go to weeklyspooky.com to find out more. Um, I think I gave myself the creeps real good. So I'm going to leave you with one more piece since we're already doing a kind of variety show as our Halloween episode. I thought I would go one better than normal because as you might have noticed, we haven't had the traditional weekly spooky theme song at all this episode. The wonderful theme composed by Ray Mattis. Well, tonight I'm going to leave you with the extended version of the song. A theme song that I believe truly captures the spirit of what we do here at Weekly Spooky and what Halloween is all about. So please enjoy that. And uh, for myself, for Ray Mattis, and for my producer, Daniel Wilder, stay scared, stay spooky. I will see you right back here next Wednesday because it doesn't matter what month it is. We're going to have a little bit of Halloween fun all our own. So uh, anyway, I will talk at you uh, later. (laughs) 